All right, now it's time for last of our lectures, but first in our hearts, biogenous sediments. These you can find several marine resources. You can find a lot of petroleum. Petroleum is really neat because it's actually the dead bits of thousands and thousands and millions of microscopic tiny organisms. So yeah, we're talking biogenic sediment that gets crushed by some huge foiengoi until it's in a liquid. What's really neat is uh, this makes up 95% of marine economic substances. 95% of what we make the money off of in the ocean is petroleum. 30% of the world's oil supply is contained in the ocean. Here is a picture of uh, some open ocean petroleum getting. You can also find these really cool things called gas hydrates, which are kind of neat, which uh, sounds weird. Uh, they're commonly called clatherates. And what they actually are is it's natural gas, it's methane, but it's methane hydrate because it has so much water and so much pressure it actually pushes into it. Methane is the result of all these chemical reactions from uh, decomposers on the ocean floor. These decomposers, they're breaking things down, it tends to be kind of an anaerobic environment, so instead of CO2, they release nasty, stanky old methane. Instead, the methane gets trapped in with the water and makes gas hydrates. What's really neat about these um, is it's a pressurized water trap so they can't escape. Methane is less dense than water so it should rise up to the surface but the pressure uh, just <laughs> smashifies it into the area so that it cannot be coming back up. You find this most often near your continental margins especially in the rise. What's really neat is here's a picture of one and you'll notice um, huge pressure. This guy's wearing gloves, not because it's dangerous, but see this white stuff here? That's the water part of it. It's ice. It's ice, guys. The black part is gook and mixed in there with that ice is methane. So you can actually hold it in your hand like these people are. You see, they've got ice that's on fire, which is, I mean, first off, that guy looks scary, but I'd be having crazy eyes too because that's freaking cool. He's got ice in his hand and the ice is on fire. It's like a magic trick. And so a lot of people are actually thinking that you could use this methane hydrate as a uh, viable energy option if we can get at it. Methane, however, is one of the worst greenhouse gases. It's one of the most powerful greenhouse gases. But like I said earlier, it is what we use in natural gas. So, you know, the gas that heats your home if you're on the city natural gas plant that is methane. A lot of times when we get a release of the methane, it creates a lot of heat and pressure, creates a lot of explosions, and a lot of these can actually lead to huge slope failures that can kick off uh, tsunamis in that area, remember, in a shallow area, and cause the whole slope to just slide down, push the water all over the place, and get a little tsunami in on the land. So there's different types of uh, biogenous sediment. You'll find all kinds of big stuff like bones, uh, teeth, shells, you know, think of any of the hard parts of animals after they die and sink down to the bottom. You can find those. Those are the big ones, but those are the ones that we're really interested in. The small stuff are way better. So you actually have microscopic shells called tests. Testa being the word for shell. You can find ooze. 30% of it is uh, tests and the rest tends to be clay. And many of these microscopic shells actually come from small algae or teeny tiny protists. This would be where our radiolarians and our foraminifers kick in, the ones you've been looking at in the lab all week. So let's talk about where we find them. Many of these are going to be floating and they stay suspended for a very long time. Remember, especially the microscopic ones are coming from organisms that have developed their surface area in a way that keeps them floating at the top of the water. Once they die, they don't have as many organic parts, they tend to lose a little bit of surface area and they're going to sink very, 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 very slowly. They come in two classes, you're going to find calcium carbonate or silicon dioxide. The silicon dioxide are a little more common just because uh, that stuff is less water soluble. Calcium carbonate tends to dissolve in the water, and so then you'll lose a lot of the calcium carbonate shells. They'll dissolve into the water and make hydrogenous sediments that we talked about a couple lectures ago. Go ahead and click on the calcium carbonate if you want to go back to that lecture. Unless you're, you know, not on a computer, then the annotations probably don't work. 
Many of these are deposited pelagically, which means they're out in the open ocean. You find them more often in areas of high productivity because those are areas that have lots of algae and therefore lots of teeny tiny microscopic other kinds of plankton eating the algae. Many of these biogenosediments are going to be diluted with large amounts of hydrogenosediment or lithogenosediment. You guys have seen in the lab that the majority of the stuff you're picking through is benlithogenous with a little bit of biogenosediments mixed in. So let's talk about the silicates. These are pelagic only, and then when they're found in that 30, 70 ooze, we call it siliceous ooze. So if it's 30% of that is ooze containing silicon dioxide type shells, then it's siliceous ooze, which is, I mean, that's a siliceous, just rolls off the tongue. Most of these are our diatoms and our radiolarians. These are two types of really cool planktonic organisms that have just beautiful shells. And so uh, you've probably heard of diatomaceous earth. It's a substance you can spread around your house. It's supposed to be really good for getting rid of fleas out of your carpet, among other things. That's actually diatomaceous ooze. The diatoms are a type of algae, which is just weird to think about like algae being like microscopic, like plant type things. They actually have uh, little microscopic silicate shells. And you also have radiolarian ooze, which is made out of radiolarians, which are protists that have shells with beautiful uh, radial symmetry. That's like, you know, the wheel symmetry. And then you can also have silcoflagellate ooze, which comes from another kind of protist that uh, they, the dinoflagellates. And they're really cool because they've got like one uh, flagellum that they hang on the side that they, you know, propel with. And they've got another one that they wrap around their body and it actually makes them spin around in a circle while they're going. So they swim like this, which is really kind of dizzy. And those are gonna have silicate base shells. And usually though, these get destroyed by, you know, other kinds of ocean things. And so how do you think it is that they accumulate? You know, to be in areas where you have a lot of it and then they get buried. So you'd have to have an area of really, really high productivity for these to really build up because like I said, many of these are destroyed on the descent down. They're so microscopic that it actually becomes water soluble. Uh, other things like pressure or you know, when things eat it, etc. So you have to have areas where they won't dissolve where they're going to be able to build up as siliceous ooze, and that will only happen directly below areas of really, really high productivity where you have lots of these organisms. Here's a couple pictures, some beautiful siliceous oozy type things that you may or may not be able to find. Here's a picture, comes right out of the book, that just shows you some beautiful siliceous ooze. What is kind of neat is another way that could preserve this other than just large amounts of huge productivity is if you had some other kind of depositional event, like some lithogenous sediment that buries it, that covers it, and that would keep it from, you know, dissolving. Now you also have calcium carbonates. Calcium carbonates come from a protist called forams or foraminifers, which are the ones that you're primarily looking for because you have sediments that come from areas with large foraminifer populations. They're sort of like radiolarians, but they have this really big opening and this really cool berry shape and they have calcium carbonate shells instead of silicon dioxide shells. You also have coccolithophores. Coccolithophores. Coco means berry or sphere. So I think cocoa puffs are literally berry puffs. I thought they were chocolate. But it means berry. So you have these uh, algae that uh, have these sort of really beautiful round things. They're also known as nanoplankton because they're smaller than regular plankton. They tend to discard these things called coccoliths. When you get a lot of coccoliths put together, it makes chalk. So chalk that we write on the chalkboards with, that's actually a calcium carbonate based biogenous sediment. A lot of those off the coast of England, that would be the White Cliffs of Dover. And you find these in calcareous ooze, which is like siliceous ooze, but instead of being 30% minimum silicates, you have 30% calcareous creatures that have left their calcium carbonate shells inside that area. And these tend to be 10 to 100 times smaller than your diatoms. Itty, 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 bitty. What's really kind of cool is they actually do photosynthesis as well. And these can be neuritic or pelagic. You tend to find more of these in warmer water areas in the tropics, so check out the Bahamian sand if you haven't seen any calcareous foraminifers yet. They're in there, just keep on digging. Here is a beautiful picture of some foraminifer shells. 
Uh, you see they're kind of uh, big clumpy things looking all like that. You guys have keys, so you can actually key out the foraminifers based on their shells. These are taken with a uh, electron microscope to give you a really good view. Here's, again, just a contrast, here's some radiolarians. See how the silicate shell has a very much different looking structure than your foraminifers. These look like pocolithophores to me. Limestone is another big one. Limestone's kind of got its foot in both worlds, being biogenous and sort of hydrogenous because limestone is made from calcium carbonate that's been deposited on the ocean floor. And then we usually get it when it uplifts to the surface. It also metamorphoses into marble, which is super valuable. But all the limestone is made out of the calcium carbonate from the shells of all these microorganisms. So here's a really nice picture showing you a nice, beautiful tropical ocean where you can find a lot of limestone. You'll see here at the bottom, you can snorkel and see this, and all of this covering the bottom here, that's all, for the most part, calcareous sediment. Most of that is limestone. So when the water's really warm, it's going to dissolve the calcium carbonate really readily, and then it turns more into sort of a hydrogenous sediment, depositing as a limestone. Here's some really beautiful neuritic limestones. You can see these big uh, wedge-shaped things that you'll find at the bottom of the ocean floor. Again, those are made out of limestones and they're called stromatolites. I'm going to name, that's going to be the middle name of at least my second-born son, stromatolite. Larry Stromatolite Patterson. Yep, I got it. Larry Stromatolite Patterson. That's a winner right there. You, they have this lobate shape, which means they look like lobes, like earlobes, that's what it means to be lobate. And they tend to be deposited in very, very fine layer, and you only find them in warm, shallow, neuritic areas, places where you're going to have lots of uh, different forams and other kinds of protists floating around, maybe some mollusks, because they have calcium carbonate shell too. And so the water has to be able to dissolve it, and then uh, it has to sit there. So let's talk about the pelagic. Calcareous. There's again, 30% of it is going to be calcareous sediment. Most of it is from the foraminifers, so we call it foraminifer ooze. The most common foram is globigenrine, so we call it globigenrine ooze, but you know, that's just fun facts. What you should write down is because of the high pressures in the ocean, it actually increases the ability of the water to dissolve things, and so calcareous ooze with the foraminifer shells tend to be dissolved very, very easily. And so they're very, very rare when you for pelagic sediments. You won't find them. You actually won't find them below what's called the lysocline, which is actually called the calcium compensation depth, or CCD, which is a depth at which calcium carbonate will dissolve readily into the water. Like you could have a 4 a.m. shell floating on down, floating on down. It'll hit the CCD and pff, it'll be gone. It'll just dissolve right into the water. So the question is, you know, how could we have any? So here's a little picture that we saw before. And you see here we're focusing on our pelagic clays. But you can see here in the colder water, you're more likely to find your siliceous tests. And in the warmer water, you're more likely to find the calcareous tests. And so what will have to happen is they'll have to really be in, uh, for them to be pelagic, they're going to have to be at a mid-ocean ridge because that's the only place where you can get it up above the CCD and also the water will be warmed much, much more, which will allow for it to be sitting there. Here's another picture just showing you, again, you've got your pelagic clays, your fine lithogenous material, most of the ocean floor. Here's an area showing you some nice manganese nodules and some siliceous ooze, which again is coming from areas where you have large amounts of siliceous activity, high areas of productivity. And then your calcareous tests, you find them most at mid-ocean ridges for the pelagic sediments. The neuritic sediments you're mostly going to find in tropical coastal regions. Make sure, before the quiz, you read box 4.1 about diatoms. It has a lot of really good info in there. You definitely want to read it because I'm going to cherry pick at least one to two questions on the quiz for that. Thank you guys for watching. That was a final sediment video.